All right, welcome back, everybody. So, today we are beginning the third, second half of the class of three. Um, this is the start of our unit on object-oriented programming. So up until this point, we've been focused on giving you a solid foundation in basic imperative programming skills, using things like loops and conditional statements to express logic in your program, and using that to accomplish straightforward tasks, right? Things that are easy to reason about, but can be difficult for you to actually get the pro computer to do when you're getting started. For the next month or so, we're going to shift gears. We're gonna keep giving you practice on imperative programming. That doesn't stop. We keep doing that all the way until May. But we're introducing a new topic here, and this is actually a really exciting moment in the class, particularly from the perspective of thinking about how we work with data. Up until this point, we've talked about ways of working with kind of Java's built-in data types. So we started off looking at ways to manipulate single integer values or floating point values, truth values. Um, we've looked at arrays, which is a pretty actually powerful data structure that we can use to uh, represent things like temperature measurements over time or music or lots of data that surround us in the world. And then we looked at, you know, strings, which are essentially arrays of characters but get a little bit of special treatment in Java. And today, what we're gonna do so we're gonna talk about how you can design your own types in Java. So you can actually get all the benefits of Java's type system and all the correctness that comes along with that. The compiler time checks that make sure that your code is correct. But you can build your own types. And this allows us to dramatically expand the way that we work with data. Because we can essentially start to build our own classes or types that allow us to model data in the real world in whatever way we want. And this starts to bring, you know, a great element of choice and creativity into our computer programs, right? It also is kind of like really the last step that we get to in terms of how we model data in Java. Once you learn how to use classes appropriately, there's really no data out there in the world that you can't work with, right? And work with effectively. All right, so, um, so for, the, for the remainder of the semester, sort of here's the plan, right? So, Particularly towards the end of the semester, we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk more about algorithms in terms of how do we use them to solve simple problems, and then also how do we reason about their performance. We'll get started on that, and that's a topic that you're gonna to see repeatedly over the next couple of semesters as you go on to take 173 and 225. We'll also talk about data structures. Um, data structures and algorithms really sort of go together very naturally, right? So how do we um, build some new data structures, which again, we'll start doing in the third half of the class. Uh, that allow us to implement algorithms on top of them in order to perform certain tasks with greater efficiency. Um, and then also sort of software development. How do we write, debug, and publish good software? This is something that you guys are learning primarily through the MP, uh, which we're continuing with the new checkpoint that we're releasing. We released yesterday to the blue team and we'll release today to the orange team. All right, so up until this point, what we've looked at, the primarily way that we've had for structuring our programs has been the function, right? A unit of programmatic logic. Um, and that allowed us to take what would otherwise be a big, unorganized jumble of code and break it into smaller pieces that accomplish specific tasks that can then be tested and then also composed in ways to build up larger programs, right? This was, has sort of been our, our approach. Today, what we're gonna start to do is actually look at another technique for doing this which is using Java's object system to combine state and behavior. So to bring these algorithms closer to the data that they work on. So now what you'll be able to do in Java is you'll be able, remember when we worked with strings. A string not only had data, but every string that you use in your program carries with it all of these useful methods. It knows how to split itself into pieces. It knows how to convert itself to a character array. It knows how to replace every character inside of it with a new character and give you back a new string. So these are all useful uh, features or algorithms that operate on top of that string data. And in Java, what's cool is that when you use the class system, those built-in, those algorithms come along with the classes that you create. And so anywhere we find a string, we also find the ability to use these useful features that it has. And then, you know, we'll, we'll do documentation and stuff like that, right? And then later in the class, we'll talk about how to reuse them. But our main focus now is on the second point, which is how do we combine state and behavior, and what does it mean to do that? All right. 
We're also getting back to the point in the class where I want to kind of, um, you know, this is a, this next unit, I think, is interesting in how it challenges students, right? I've seen people that do extremely well in the first part of the class, um, partly maybe because they have some background in basic comparative programming, and they get to objects and they really struggle because this is more conceptual. Um, it's also more creative. There are fewer right answers in this part of the class. We're talking about how do we model data. Those models are things that you're going to build. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the syntax and some best practices in the Java programming language for how we use the built-in language features to create our new types and use those to model data. But at the end of the day, when you go off and do this in the real world, this is one of the places in your program where, you know, when I'm writing code, I really have to kind of slow down and be like, wait, I'm making an important choice here, right? What does this piece of data look like, you know? What other pieces of data does it contain? How am I designing this? Because this is really where you're starting to design things in your program. Right? There are some constraints. Your, your classes have to actually carry around enough information about the data you're working with to be useful, but there's also a lot of choices that you make along the way. Okay? So, so again, so these objects start to expose us to these design aspects. There's no right answers, but it gives you a chance to use these very complementary human capabilities. It's not just logic, right? We also want you to be creative, you know, imagine how your things are going to be used, think both into the future, um, and think about, you know, how the whole program works together. This really pushes on a lot of these design aspects, right, that again are, are things that maybe we don't always associate with computer science or programming, but are incredibly important, right, and also incredibly rewarding, right? This is very complementary to some of the thinking that you have to do as a software developer. You know, this really is a full brain profession, a full brain, um, you know, activity, right? It's not just logical thinking, right? There's a lot of design that goes into this, and today is, is the starting point for that. All right, so objects in Java combine state and behavior. When we talk about objects, we're going to frequently talk about these two aspects of the class or the object that we're talking about. What data does it store? So on some level, an object can act like a variable. It holds data, right? Think about the strings that we were working with. When we created a string, we told Java the sequence of characters. Sometimes we initialize it with a literal. We tell Java the exact sequence of characters that we want that string to contain. But objects also carry around these behaviors. So on some level, they also act like functions. When I had a string variable, I could call methods on it using this dot notation that at the time was a little bit mysterious, and we just kind of dealt with it because it was like, okay, just use this magic syntax and this is what's going to happen. But now we're going to see exactly how that works and why. So again, when we talk about objects and we start designing our own classes, we're going to talk about two things. What data does this object store? And then what can it do? What are the useful functions or methods that are associated with it? Now, not every class in Java has both of these components. There are classes that only store data, right? They only act as a container for some pieces of data that are related to our ability to model something about the world. And then there's also cases where we have libraries that actually don't store any data, they just provide methods, okay? But the objects that we're gonna talk about, for the most part, are gonna be ones that use both of these features. They both store data, and they provide useful methods that come along with them. So again, think back to strings. It stores character data, provides these useful methods um, that come along every time you use it. And so, you know, one of the fun things about objects is they really do bring together these core, two core concerns of computer science, which is algorithms and data, right? Data, how do we work with data? How do we, you know, uh, bring data into our programs? We'll have you guys do a lab in a couple weeks where you work with some data in a format called CSV that's sadly still very common in the world. Um, and you'll bring that into your program and, and learn how to use that using the Java programming language and program it, right? And do calculations on it, load it out of a file, do some work on it, present a result, right? Um, the al but then you're also writing algorithms along the way, right? So you're both, you know, in taking this data, storing it using Java classes, and then writing algorithms on top of that to do some useful stuff. All right, so we're getting close to seeing some code, I promise. But so the, the technical definition of an object, one of the things that we need to get uh, straight here right off the bat is some terminology. And I will try to be as clear about this as I can. 
And there are three kind of words that we're gonna be dealing with here, right? One is object, well actually four, sorry. Object or instance, and then class or type, okay? So an object refers to an instance of a class. And now we're sort of getting again into the little bit more of a conceptual realm here, right? So can someone give me an example? Like an example drawn from the real world of a class and an instance of a class, like in the, in the real world. A class of things and then an instance of that class. Yeah. Yeah, so vehicles, things that move, maybe that have four wheels or something like that. That's a class. It's a sort of synonym for a class could be category. It's a category of things in the world. An instance is a specific vehicle, like there's a vehicle parked down in the parking lot out there. That's an instance of the class automobile. Automobile has many different types of you know, uh, cars that it uh, can, can sort of encompass, but there's a specific instance. So student, student is a class or a category. Every one of you is an instance of a student. Right? University of Illinois student is a subclass of that original class. All of you, most of you are currently University of Illinois students. Right? So, so this has a direct analogy. You know, again, this is one of the fun things about objects. We start to actually um, see the intersection between cat, you know, theory about how we classify the world and how we actually write our programs. Right? So a class is a more general concept than an object. Right? An object has specific qualities that a class lacks. So if I think about the class of automobiles, you know, some of them are red, some of them are green, you know, some of them are really sporty looking, other ones have two doors or four doors. So there's all, this de all these details, but that doesn't mean that they're not members of that class or that category. When we use the term object, and again, I'll try to be as precise about this as possible, we're talking about an instance of a class, okay? When we create an instance of a class in Java, we frequently have to define some of the specific attributes of that instance. So if I want to talk about a specific car rather than automobiles in general, I have to tell you how many doors does it have. You know, if I, if I found a car out in the parking lot, I was describing it to you. There's a bunch of things I need to say about it so that I could describe exactly the, that instance of a particular class, okay? All right, so hopefully this will get more clear in a minute. All right, so here's our first bit of Java code to look at, right? Um, this is a class definition. So in the Java programming language, what we're doing here is we're describing a class of objects that we want to be able to work with. A, a reasonable synonym in Java for this is this is a type. We are defining a new type in the Java programming language. Up till now, the types we've worked with are int, long, string, double, but now I'm creating a new type. So let's go through this step by step. When I create a new type in Java or a new class, I start with the class keyword. That's another built-in keyword. And then, this is the name. That's up to you. Call it what you want. However, obviously there are, you know, if I was working with a class of automobiles and I called them foo, that probably wouldn't be as useful in my program because I'm gonna see this name a lot. So usually there's a natural name for this, particularly when you're working with real-world data, right? If I was storing information about the students in the class, I might call this student, right? In this case, I'm calling it person. Then I open up a block, right? You see the curly brace there. And now, inside this block, what I'm doing is I'm defining the state, the data that this stores, and the behavior. So what you find in here is a mixture of state, so these are things that look like variable declarations, and behavior, things that look like functions. So this is a method. It looks like a method, right? Looks exactly like the methods you've been writing. It just happens to be inside this class declaration, okay? Another analogy that we sometimes use is a class is sort of like a blueprint, right? It shows Java how to create a new instance of this class. So what is this saying? Let's go through this slowly, right? Some of you that have seen this before, you know, I might want to close your eyes for a few minutes, but a lot of you, I think this is new, and so, and this is really important, right? Okay, so in my class definition, remember, this is up to you. You write this. This didn't just come down, handed on a stone tablet. Like, you were working with 
data about people in your program, and you needed a class to store that data. Now, your data about people was too complex to be represented by like an array of integers, right? You know, people have multiple attributes. Not every one of those attributes is the same type. They have a name, that's a string. They have an age, that's an int, or maybe a double if you want to store it with more precision. So this is a place where I'm seeing the limitations of the current types that I'm able to work with, but happily Java allows me to define new ones. So to work with people in this particular application, I need to know two things about them. I need to know their age, and I'm storing that as an integer. Again, you could store it as a double. Obviously, people's age is not, not in, I mean, when, when we ask each other how old we are, we say 40 or 28 or whatever. Um, but obviously, our age is a very precise floating point number that is always increasing. Right? All of you are older since you've walked in the room. Maybe some of you feel even older than you should feel um, over the past five minutes. So the other thing I'm storing about each person is a name. It's a string. So again, for my program, now is this all the information that I might need to store about a person if I was working with another type of application? No. You might need to store all sorts of other information. So what are other attributes that a person might have right, that you could imagine being important in a particular application? things about a person that I might need to store as part of this class, depending on the application that I was using. Yeah? Height or weight, yeah, you know, eye color, what else? Physical attributes? Give me another piece of data about a person that you, you might use, you know? Like maybe if I'm storing like a database of information about, um, you know, uh, driver's licenses or something. That's, that's information that typically is on a driver's license. What, what's another piece of information? What's a, what's a very valuable piece of information that a lot of companies try to know about you all the time? Yeah? Well, give me whatever you got. Yeah, information about your fingerprints. That's interesting. Yeah, in the back. Gender? Yeah? What about up here? Race? Location? Right? So I guarantee you're, you know, somebody out there, Google, Facebook, maybe multiple you know, places has a database and their person class has location. And that's the piece of data that they try to store about you. And you know, depending on what apps you use or whatever, they probably have an idea of generally where you are, right? Like you're on campus somewhere in the visit, right? So again, the way that we design our classes is determined by what our program is trying to do, right? So here I've decided that my person is gonna contain a name and an age. And then, so these are the, this is the piece of data. This is the data that's associated with my person. Every person that I create is gonna have these attributes. If I need to add more, I can do that. If I don't need as many, I can remove them. So this is the top part of this, right? So this is how I declare that my person is gonna have these attributes. I put in the type and then a name. Now this is very similar to a variable declaration. And you might be wondering, can I also initialize these values? And you can, right? We'll see what effect that has a little bit. The second thing I can include in my person, uh, in my Java classes, are methods. These are known as instance methods. This means that every person will have a method called print name that you can call on that person instance. And we'll see exactly what this does and why this, uh, why this looks the way it does in a minute. Okay, but this defines the behavior associated with this class. Questions about this before we go on? This is new and it's extreme, like I said, it's extremely important to understand. Okay, good. So I, okay, I just said this, right? It's worth reviewing every instance. So every instance of the class person is going to have a name that's a string and an age that's an int. And again, you can think of person as a new type in the Java language. And the compiler will help you with this. So for example, if you create a person and you try to access an attribute called weight, it'll complain. It'll say you haven't defined that, right? But this is, again, the way that we start to merge together disparate types of data in Java. So no longer do I have to try to coerce everything into an array. Now I can say a, a datum, a piece of data, can be combined of lots of other types of data. Right? I can have a person that contains strings and ints and doubles and maybe other more complex objects as well. All right, good. 
So one of the things that distinguishes Java, um, and this is not true just about Java, it's also true about a variety of languages, but in Java, unlike Python and some other languages you might be familiar with, once you define a class, you can't change it while the program is running. Java uses the information that you provide about the class when it compiles your code to check to make sure that you've done things correctly. So once the program starts to run, if you suddenly decide that a person needs to have a wait field too, no dice. You can't do it. You have to actually go back, add that field to your person class, recompile your code, and then distribute the program again. There's no way to do this at runtime. Um, now again, you may find this annoying when you're working on smaller programs, but this ends up being a huge benefit when you're building complex um, applications that need to store lots of data and when you're working with many other people. Okay, so now let's talk about an instance. So what we've, been, what we've talked about up until now is this, this is a definition of a class, right? There's a certain new type in Java that combines both a name and an age and also provides this method called print name. But what if we wanna create one of these, right? How do I do that? What if I actually want an instance of a person that I can use to store information about a specific person? In order to do that, we use this new keyword. Now, you may remember that we saw examples of this when we looked at strings, okay? But we haven't really talked about what it does. So new in Java is the keyword that we use to create a new instance of a class. That instance sometimes referred to as an object or an instance, okay? Um, so over here on the right side of this expression, I'm creating a new person. So I have this class that I've defined that defines a type of object that combines both a name and an age and has this print name method. And now I'm creating a specific person. That specific person is gonna have their own name and their own age. So every instance of a class in Java stores its own data, has access to its own data, right? So I do this on the right and then I'm saving it so this is a standard assignment. So on the right side, I'm creating a new person, and I'm saving it into this variable called Jeffrey that I've defined is going to store a person. I will talk more in a few weeks about exactly what gets stored in there and some of the complications that result. But for now, you can think of this as a variable that stores a person, an instance of a person. There's no way to store a class. Actually, there is, but we don't, we don't talk about it because this is you know, far too advanced. So we store instances of classes. Okay. So person is a class. Jeffrey here is a variable that stores an instance of that class. So now Jeffrey has a specific name and a specific age. Okay. All right, last thing, I think we're getting to a playground in a minute where we can mess around a little bit and see how this works. Um, the way that we access the state and behavior of a class is by using dot notation on an instance of that class. So here on line seven, I'm creating a new person object. I have the new keyword, I have the type. We'll talk about exactly what this is doing next week, maybe later this week, I can't remember. Um, now what I'm doing is, I, because I have an instance of this class, every instance of this class has both an age and a name. I have to find them up here. And so now I can set that variable. Java knows that age is an integer because that's how I've defined it in my class declaration. So now I can use, this is called dot notation. So I use the variable that stores the instance of the cla class, variable that stores the object, dot, and then if I'm setting one of the variables, I just, this looks like just assigning to a variable, right? If I'm calling a method, it looks like a method call. We'll see one of those in a minute, okay? I can both set and get that, like it's a normal variable, right? All right, so finally, let's mess around with this a little bit. So this is my person class. Um, now down here, I'm creating a new person, and we'll see if this works, it does, okay? Let me show you some, you know, again, let's, let's, let's show you some things about this. So let's say I tried it to set this to something like this. What's gonna happen now? Anybody want to make a prediction about what happens if I try to run this? Okay. 
Let's try and see. Yeah, okay, so, and here's the thing. When I try to use dot notation to set Jeffrey.age to be a double, Java knows what that field represents because I provided it with this class definition. So what Java does is it says, okay, dot age, and it goes up into the class declaration, and it says, okay, what is dot age? Dot age is an int. Can I assign a float to an int? No. Same rules that I had before, because I might destroy data. Right? You know, so if I try to assign, you know, 38.5, same problem, right? I'm gonna have to lose that, okay? If I wanted to change that, let's say I wanted to store more accurate information about the age in my program, I need to change my model. So I go up to the class declaration, and I just say that, okay, so this type contains one field that's a string and a second field that's a double. So now I can assign a, a double value to it, right? Let me show you something else that's, and this is probably the thing about objects that is really difficult, particularly for people to start understanding at first, right? Let me create a second person, and we'll call it her, okay? I don't know, something like that, okay? So now I have two separate people in my program. Whenever you see new, it means that there's a new instance of the person class that's being created. I have two separate people. Each one of them has their own age. So if I print my age, I get this. If I print Lily's age, I get 0 0.2, something like that. It might be 0 0.1. Um, I can also print my age down here. These are two separate instances of the class. They're two separate objects. So again, imagine that if the class is students, it's like I picked two of you. You have different ages. When one of you has a birthday, it doesn't change the age of the other, right? Um, if I assign one of you a grade, it doesn't change the grade of the other person. So two instances of the class. All right. Let's see what happens. Who wants to, so, so let's try this, just to find out. So when we had, when we worked with local variables, Java would force us to initialize them. So if I try to declare a variable and not initialize it in a function, it's not going to work. In a class definition, it does work. Who wants to guess what the age of Lily will be when I print this out? Yeah. Zero, yeah. So Java initialized that double to be zero because I didn't provide an initializer. Now, there are standard default initializers for all of the primitive types, like ints, longs, it's zero, basically, for everything. And then I think a Boolean is false, um, and then I can't remember what the character is. You can look these up online. What about the name? Okay, so the name is a string. Anybody wanna guess what the uninitialized value of name is? Yeah, no. Yeah, so this is one of the places where um, no can come bite us. If I have an object that's an instance variable, so we refer to these variables up here as instance variables because every instance of person has them. Every instance of person has a name that's a string and an age that's a double. If I don't provide an initializer in the class declaration, for object types I get no. And again, this is a little dangerous because now if I wanted to say, okay, what's the length of Lily's name, I have this null pointer exception that I try to avoid, right? Now, of course, if I set lily.name equal to Lily, then I'm, then I'm fine, right? Then I can compute the name. Any questions about this before we go on? Yeah. Yeah, we'll get there. You're like four slides ahead of me. So the question is, what's going on inside that print name? But let's, you know what, let's try it. Let's just, you know, just because we're adventurous, let's try it. So let's try calling print name and see what happens. Now, 
Why is it angry with me? Oh, because it, it doesn't return anything. Okay, so I'm just going to call lily.printName. This is a function that doesn't return. Okay, and then let's call jeffrey.printName. Okay, so again, this is just a little bit of a preview of what we're about to talk about, right? But what does it look like, right? So it looks like this refers to the current instance of the class that's running the method, right? When I call print name on Lily, this dot name refers to the name that I've set for Lily on line 10. When I call Jeffrey dot print name, let me pull this down a little bit. This dot name refers to the name that I have not set for Jeffrey. Okay? Again, we'll come back and, and cover this in a sec. It's a great question. Other questions? All right, let's keep going. So the variables I define as part of my class declaration can be either primitive types or other, other uh, objects. So here, now I'm looking at a little bit more of a complicated model for real-world data that involves two different types. So now let's imagine I'm working on a program that allows people to rearrange furniture in a room using some sort of graphical interface or something. So information the program needs to know, um, room, right? You know, what's the name of the room? Maybe I'm gonna print that on the screen, and then what are the dimensions of the room so I can, I can display it the proper size. Dimensions here refers to another custom type that I've created in my program that I've called dimensions. A dimensions in this program has a width and a height. And again, these could be doubles or ints, just, you know, why not? Um, and so now what I'm doing down here is I'm creating a new room, a new instance of the class room. I've got my new keyword. I've got the name of the class. And then I've got a variable that's going to store an instance of that class. Now, when I have an object that's part of a class, it doesn't get initialized when I create a new instance of that class. So I'm going to initialize it um, manually here. And then, so again, I can use dot notation as many times as I need to. So here what I'm doing is I'm saying the dimensions of dining room, the width of the dimensions of dining room is equal to 10. So when I start with dining room, which is of type room, I follow that to dimensions. Dimensions is of type dimensions. And then I follow that to the instance of dimensions that I just created on line 10, and that has a width and a height. So I can set it there. And again, this is really common, right? It's really common when you're working with data that it's not flat. It has structure to it, right? Why am I creating a separate dimensions class? Why not just have every room have a width and a height? Anybody, anybody want to speculate? Like for this small program, it seems like I've just made things more complicated. Why not just let a, every room have its own width and height? Why would I, why would I create a separate dimensions type in my program? Any guesses? I like that answer. Let's, let's, let's try to start with that. So the question is, you know, I, another way to put it is, is there anything else in this program that's going to have a dimension? Probably, like the pieces of furniture you're going to move around, right? Um, you know, maybe, you know, other things and I need to do the, the layout of the room, right? So if my room has a width and a height and everything else has a width and a height, then I lose the chance to have this common functionality associated with the dimension. So now if I create like furniture as a class, the furniture could have a name and a dimension, just like the room does. And then I could use those pieces of data separately. Yeah, so this makes my, my, my class more modular. So again, here's an example of this. Um, and actually, let's print it just so that we can convince ourselves that this worked. What's the value of the height going to be at this point? Zero, right, because it's not initialized. 
And so I get the uninitialized values here. Okay. And so again, as I've been, I've sort of been harping on this as we've gone, right? But Java allows us, allow us to create these custom types. And these custom types, again, behave in the exact same way as the built-in types that you've been used to using. They are checked by the compiler. Um, so for example, if I go back over here, and let's say that I misspell height, right? If you're working in IntelliJ, you'll get like a red angry message, and if you're, this is a compiler error. Let me just make sure that's clear. In Python, this is an error that happens when the program runs. Okay, because Python can't check stuff like this for you. So in Java, the compiler knows what the type of dimensions is, and the compiler knows that dimensions has two instance variables, a width and a height, and it knows how you spelled them. And so it can check stuff like this for you when you're preparing the program. Now if you really spelled height that way, then you're cool, right? Um, but if you spelled it correctly, then bugs like this are very easy to fix. Trust me as someone who has done this for a long time. You will make typos. You will misspell stuff. Like, none of us are perfect typists. And when you work in a language that helps you with stuff like this, it really, really reduces the number of problems you're gonna have. I can't tell you the number of times I've had things crash because I mistyped something, like a variable name, and I was working in a language that didn't help me with that. This is one of the really nice things about, about the Java programming language. Okay. Um, and again, it also knows things like the type of the dimensions, right, like we said before. So even if I'm, even if I've typed things properly um, and I'm trying to use something that only takes ints, this will, uh, this will also, the compiler will also check this and help. Okay. Let's look at an example of this, right? And this is directly drawn from the first MP checkpoint, right? All right. So how many people have, completed get target within range, right? It's a fairly, you know, straightforward function uh, once you figure out what to do, which is what takes most of the time. Um, but, but think about this, right? Because when you guys started this MP, we didn't, um, you know, I had to, you know, tell Ben, well, they don't know anything about objects yet, so you can't use an object, right? So what are we doing? We're passing you an array of latitudes and an array of longitudes that are doubles. And we're telling you that if you want to find each point on the path, you look it up by using the same index in both arrays. There's actually a name for this, but I'm not gonna tell you because it's dumb. It's a dumb thing to do, right? What's a better way to do this, right? So again, on this MP, we were limited to using the primitive types and arrays of primitive types because you guys didn't know about objects yet. But now that I can define my own classes, what do I really want here? Someone help me. Give me, a, give me a very simple class declaration that will make this piece of logic, and to be honest, the rest of your MP, which deals with location a lot, a lot easier to work with. Remember, we wanna use our class declarations to model real world what, what type of data is this working with? Maybe that's a good starting point. Fundamentally, the MP is manipulating primarily what type of data? You guys have been doing the MP, correct? Right? Some of you. What type of data is the MP using? You can say this in, a, in, in human language. Coordinates, okay, yeah, a little mechanical. Somebody give me a more colloquial definition of that. What? Numbers, oh what, yeah, but they're numbers that represent what? Location, yeah. This is a location-based app. The game is location-based, you go places and then things happen, right? So, what's a way to represent location? If I was designing a class to represent location, what would it look like? We don't even need to do this on paper, we'll just do it in our heads. A point in space. What are the different pieces of data that you need to combine together to represent that point in space? Someone who 
haven't volunteered anything yet today. A point in space. Give me one piece of data you need to represent a point in space. Latitude and longitude. Not a trick question. Is that enough, technically? Like if you really wanted to do this for real, if you, is this enough for every application that uses location? What else might you need? Yeah. Time. time. Okay, where, so I could, if I'm tracking a person's location over time, I also want to say when I measure that location. But what other piece of location? What other piece of data do I need? Yeah. Altitude. Right. Yeah, so if I was really tracking someone's location over time, I would track latitude, longitude, altitude, and time. Those would be the things that would be part of my location class. Right. Here, if I combine the latitude and longitude into a single class, then what I can do is I can pass you an array of location objects. That's, what we're gonna, that's how we're going to work with location in the future on the MP. We're not going to mess around with these synchronized arrays. We're just going to give you an object, and that object will have a latitude and a longitude property that you'll be able to access. So it'll dramatically clean up, clean up this code, right? So what we really want here is a location type that stores a latitude and a longitude, and then what we can do is we can rewrite this, um, and that might look something like this, right? And so now look at how look at how much more intuitive this code is, right? So we went from looking something like this, where I had this latitude-longitude um, array. Now I'm saying, and I have this is valid, right? So this is part of the game. There's this notion that a particular pair of coordinates is valid. So now I can call get target within range. I pass it a path, which is a series of location coordinates, and then my current location, right? So now this is a lot more intuitive. Right, and you're going to work with these by just saying current location dot latitude, current location dot longitude. Okay. So, so up until this point, we've really been talking about objects primarily as a way of structuring data, right? Joining together multiple different types of data so that I can represent real-world entities, like a location that has two doubles associated with, or maybe three or four, right? A person that has a name and an age, right? A student that has university ID and a dorm and an address on campus and stuff like that, right? But one of the cool things about classes in Java is that it can also do things, right? So here's an example drawn from our, uh, the dimensions example, right? So now I'm looking again at this class and we're getting familiar with how to parse these. So this is a class called dimensions. It stores two pieces of data. Now, how you or sometimes people ask, how do I organize my classes? That's totally up to you. Java doesn't have any rules about this. You can put things inside the class in any order. When we look at it in class, we're looking at small classes. I'll typically put the variables at the top and then any instance methods at the bottom, which we're about to talk about. So here, I've got a class that defines dimensions, and I'm using ints to represent its width and height. Again, I could use doubles, but I'm using ints for this. Now, what is one thing that I might want to know one is a useful uh, property or a useful calculation that I might want my dimensions object to be able to perform. To find the area. This might be something that I would do a lot in that application I was talking about before where I was trying to figure out how to lay, lay out furniture in a room. So now what I can do is I'm defining what's called an instance method. An instance method, the declaration looks exactly like a function that you've already been writing. But there's some differences, right? So overall, this looks a lot like the function, function declarations we've been writing. This is a function called area. It returns an int. It takes no arguments. It opens up a block, and then there's code inside. What I'm doing is I'm returning. Now I've got this keyword that I need to reckon with. So I'm returning this.width times this.height. And what I can do is, after I've set up a dimensions example down here with a height of 20 and a width of 10, I can call this function on the instance of the class. So my object, like a string, carries around these useful methods that you can call. 
And I can do that any time I need, anytime I need to know the area. All right, so let's see how this works. Let's see if it works, first of all. Okay, that looks correct. Now, let's create another dimensions object. And this is, again, this is important. Because this is, again, one of the things that I think tends to trip people up. So I'm going to create another dimensions object. And let's give it a different width and height. Now I'm calling two different functions. Well, sorry, I'm calling the same function, but I'm calling it on two different instances of the class. The function declaration is the same. It doesn't take any inputs, but it's returning two different results. So the reason for this is that instance methods have access to the instance variables that are to def and the values that are defined on that instance of the class. So when my first, and let's, let's prove this to ourselves by doing this. Let's print width. Now, it turns out that I actually don't even need to use this here. I can do it this way. Maybe that's easier to, to explain. Okay? So the first time I called area, the width value is 10. And that's because I called it on example, and I had set examples width to 10. The second time I call area, I'm calling it on second. Second is a separate instance of dimensions. It has its own width and height. And so when the second call to area runs, width is 20. These are two, again, it's like two completely different people. They can have completely different attributes. When I call the method, the method works on any instance of dimension but it has access to the local variables defined on, sorry, it has access to the instance variables defined on that instance of dimensions. So again, this is one of these things that's important to wrap your head around, right? Because it looks, this looks weird. It's like, where are the width and height coming from? They're coming from that instance of dimensions. So someone asked about this, and this is what this is. So this is a keyword that refers to this, the currently, uh, the instance of the class that's currently executing the method. Now, as I showed you a minute ago, you don't have to use this. You can. So I can say this dot width. This means this is my width. That will work. But I can also omit these. A lot of times, to be honest, I think it's cleaner to just leave them all. The width there, so, so keep in mind, Width is not passed to area, okay? Width is not defined inside area. It's not a parameter of the function. It's an instance variable on that, on that instance of the class that I happen to define. If you want to use, be more explicit, you can use this, but it works the same way. All right, I think I'm out of time, which is, all right, so as you guys are getting up, uh, midterm starts today in the CBTF. I wish you guys the best of luck. Um, as a reminder, there are 12 multiple choice questions focused on code reading tasks. They're a little longer than the ones that you, none of this really short stuff you normally see at the beginning of a quiz. We have three programming questions. There's one on arrays, one on multidimensional arrays, a third on strings. I will see you guys on Wednesday. Good luck on the midterm. One of these questions is drawn from the homework problems. So use those to practice. Oh, we're going to release the next MP checkpoint tonight at 8 p.m. to everybody. The blue team should already have it. Uh, good luck to the orange team finishing up MP0.